Darien, Georgia. To Charleston, South Via, Route 17. The non leisurely tour into Myrtle Beach on March 1st eventually turned into a leisurely tour out of Myrtle Beach six weeks later. Other than destroying my rig's steps because I forgot to retract them before leaving, it was a relaxing six-hour drive to Darien, about an hour south of Savannah. It's a good start to the next part of my journey. To Charleston, South via Route 117. Punctuated with the occasional small village, the highway is, for the most part, a bucolic tour through the ocean coast portion of South Carolina and, eventually, Georgia. Trees on both sides of the road and land as flat as you'd find in Kansas, and progress at average 60 miles per hour. The actual speed limit was 70. It was only 255 miles from Myrtle Beach to Darien, so an easy one-day junket, including setting up and breaking down the riglet. Back in the camper, the only thing upset in the commute was my daughter's Christmas rock, which moved a few feet from where I had initially put it. I figure bigger rocks skitter across the floor of Death Valley on their own, so I had no reason to complain about the rig's bumpiness, or lack thereof, on the southward route. Route 17 in South Carolina is mostly a small two-lane road, with lanes briefly increasing in number as you pass through small towns along the coast. Though slower than the interstate, it was a pleasant change from routes 95 and 81 and all the truck traffic. You got there slower, but you got to see a lot more local scenery along the way. Into Charleston I purposely chose to stay on Route 17, as it led straight to the city of Charleston, South Carolina. As you can see, the drive through Charleston is very picturesque, certainly better than what you see in places like Boston. Driving down this parkway made me imagine that it was probably like motoring down Memorial Drive in Boston 80 years ago, that is, before Memorial Drive became part of the NASCAR circuit. Plus, who couldn't smile upon seeing the phrase, keep on smiling, painted on the back of a dump truck? The route is not only somewhat languid compared to Boston, but it is also extremely scenic. When temperatures are reaching into the low 90s, seeing all the deciduous trees and the occasional pond was both cooling and comforting, especially since I'd recently been playing whack-a-mole with various snowstorms just to get here. But just cruising down Route 17 north of Charleston proved to be a relaxing experience. As we climb to the bridge that takes us into Charleston, I'm not sure what awaits me. On a personal note, the city of Charleston has good memories for me, as I got married there almost 30 years ago. On Route 17, after you enter Charleston, there's an exit for Folly Beach, which is only seven miles south of Route 17. We got married on that beach, then spent the afternoon photographing the gardens and some of the local mansions. Great times, for sure. Out of Charleston. Once through the city, I found myself still on Route 17, traveling south towards Darien, an hour or two south. Before that, I had to get past Savannah. I hear that the city is beautiful, but constraints and finances and time kept me from stopping and enjoying the sights. Perhaps another time. After 40 minutes or so, I passed an exit for Beaufort, South Carolina. I had forgotten that it was there. My younger brother and his wife moved to Beaufort in the early 80s. At that time, John went through basic training at Paris Island, one of the main training sites for the Marine Corps, this one on the East Coast. I knew I wouldn't have another chance to check out this charming small city, so I took the next exit and backtracked to the outskirts. Driving through the older historical neighborhoods, I felt that I had slipped back through decades of time to an earlier age. Downtown was nestled right up against the shore. The regular neighborhoods provided small to large houses, most of which were decked out with front yards, tree-lined streets, and porches, all classic southern architectural elements. Predictably, the higher-priced neighborhoods displayed many of the same elements, only on a much larger and grander scale. 
Unfortunately, I did not have time to visit the Marine Base after seeing the extensive base entrance protocols in Western Massachusetts and San Antonio, Texas. I wasn't sure how far to actually get towards or onto the base. No doubt, though, the DIs, or drill instructors, were still tenderly caring for their present cycle of trainees. Then, back on the highway to Savannah, I ignored the exit ramp for Route 17 and continued down 95. As with the Charleston area, Savannah lies on the coastline that looks more like Swiss cheese than anything else. You keep passing over estuaries and past sawgrass coastlines until the geography changes in size. By then, you're experiencing larger bridges and taller views of the coastline that are open up to the nearby Atlantic. The bridges are high enough and the estuaries wide enough that freighters and tankers can access the seaside port of Savannah proper. Eventually, I continue past the Prunish Coast and over the South Carolina-Georgia border into Savannah. Through Savannah After that, one of the most thrilling moments, and one I almost missed the video because it came up so quickly, was crossing over the work of art called the Talmadge Memorial Bridge. Like the Tobin Bridge near Boston's Museum of Science, this is a stunning bridge spanning the Savannah River between downtown Savannah and Hutchinson Island. The original bridge was built in 1953, and then a replacement bridge was completed in 1991. The newer bridge was also referred to as the Talmadge Memorial Bridge. When you first approach the bridge, you're greeted with an impressive rise in altitude. You don't really see the surface of the bridge until you top the crest. Then it seems to be flat traveling with two white spires in the distance. As you pass these spires, you'll see them attached to thick cables connected to the bridge. Essentially, these cables are holding up the bridge off the water, tankers, freighters, and recreational boats. On to Darien. It was another hour of heading south to Darien. Reaching the exit, the campgrounds were only a quarter of a mile from that exit. As you can see, though, Georgia's coastline is more like the surface of a prune than it is a straight line. At some point, Georgia's DOT made the decision to travel over these estuaries instead of driving around them. This decision not only made for more bridges, but also resulted in straighter lines of travel. And these straight lines of travel reduced time to driving from points A to B, and connected many small towns more than did Route 95, which paralleled Route 17 to the west. It also improved connections with the offshore communities like Jekyll Island, allowing them to flourish in terms of the fishing and tourist industries. As you'd imagine, with that many bridges, some of which are old and many of which are located near a corrosive ocean, Georgia has a good number of bridges that are deemed deficient. Nationally, there are about 185 million people traveling on approximately 56,000 structurally deficient bridges. Almost 2,000 of these bridges are on interstate highways that intertwine through all 50 states. With a total of almost 15,000 bridges, Georgia ranks number 27, with 700 of the bridges in need of attention. I just hope that I'm driving over structurally indeficient bridges. Nonetheless, the coast is still prunish, regardless of the number of good and bad bridges. I ended up at that exit for Derry in Georgia. Just off the exit was the Inland Harbor RV Park, the place I'd stay for three or four days. A mile up the street from the local Bilo, a grocery store, the small RV park sat on a couple of acres of land, enclosed in an eight-foot fence with an entry keypad. I really hadn't been to a lot of RV parks yet, but I had never seen an entrance quite like this one. 
It looked more like the front of an antique country store. The inside of the park office was like the outside. Turning to my left, I could see the site that I had reserved. An empty spot right between the light pole and the flagpole. It looked safe and adequate. Of course, the access gate helped with that safety aspect. But I did wonder about the need for a gated RV park in such a sylvan setting. The site was a drive through as well, which made landing the rigglet a simple matter. Once again, I promised myself that I would practice backing up in a parking lot somewhere, sometime. Though in the long run, I never did. On the first day, thunder and lightning all day. It was a good time to get the computer equipment set up and to clean the rigglet a bit. Times like this, with the rain hammering on the roof, made for a relaxing day. I never really liked rainy days before, but that changed living in the rigglet as long as the rainy day didn't extend into a week. Meanwhile, there's just something about the sound of rain on the roof of the camper and the thunder that sometimes accompanies it. It was my first thunderstorm since leaving New England, and I do like thunderstorms. It also gave me the time to further research my main objectives for stopping here, the shrimp fisheries a few miles down the road, and Jekyll Island, which was 27 miles away. We'll explore Jekyll Island in some detail in the next episode. My main reason for coming to Darien was to photograph the shrimp boat wharfs along the southern end of the town. The picturesque layout included some nice restaurants, stone walkways, a utilitarian but lit walkway, and views of dozens of fishing boats prepping to catch shrimp along the Georgia coast. I hadn't realized that shrimp fishing was done that far north. Being a New England boy, I'd always assumed that most of the shrimp were caught off the Louisiana coast. At least that's what I learned from Forrest Gump. This experience taught me that shrimp were caught as far north as the North Carolina coast, up near Camp Lejeune, where some of the footage from the movie was taken. Okay. Yeah, but don't you be thinking that I'm going to be calling you sir. No, sir. about As we can see from this historical marker, the Darien Seaport has undergone several changes in the last 200 years. It wasn't until the 1930s and 40s, though, that the town became involved in commercial harvests of seafood, primarily shrimp. Anyways, I did get to where the wharves were, or were supposed to be. They were no longer there. Neither was the walkway, the restaurants, or the beautiful views on that part of the coast. Instead, I found the start of a metal superstructure that would eventually become a condominium, high priced because of the location and the beautiful early morning views of the sun rising above the tidal flats. At first, I thought I'd made a mistake and drove a couple miles down the road, then a few miles back, across the main stretch, and a mile or two down the opposite end of the road. Nothing. Instead of a public, rustic, and scenic waterfront area, there was a construction site with a few girders reaching for the sky. Eventually, the Enterprise would claim that, quote, One fun feature will be the screened vent room on the dock, with a keypad gate to this dock and its slips will be exclusively for condo owners and future hotel guests. Source, oaksontheriver.com For more details on the condos, restaurant, hotel, and marketplace that are being built right now, 
check out this website. The beginning price, $490,000 and up. Before leaving Darien, I did a bit more research on the internet. The Oaks on the River project had the groundbreaking on January 11th, only a couple of months before I had reached Darien, and they had finished their demo of the walkway in the old docks a month later. Little wonder I found nothing but the start of a construction site. Source, Darien News. Later that morning, I was shopping in the local Milo. I asked the lady at the register what happened to the beautiful stretch with the shrimp boats. She said essentially, don't get me going on that. Apparently the decision to do this was made at high levels, or whatever passes for high levels in a small town like Darien. The townspeople were neither notified nor asked for their input, and apparently a lot of them were still upset about it. Darien's a pretty town, and the waterside was its best attribute. Suddenly, one day, it was all gone to a corporate interest, and priced well out of reach of the average person living in Darien. The single survivor of the construction progress? One large majestic oak, one of the few remaining oaks on the river. Image source, Brunswick News. Early the next morning, Easter Sunday, I left Meriden on Route 17 South, past what used to be the prettiest part of town, and traveled further south to Jekyll Island. We'll examine Jekyll Island in the next episode before we get back onto Route 95 and head south to Florida. Thanks for taking the time to watch this part of my journey. If you enjoyed this video, click on the like button just below. If you'd like to continue traveling with Fimian, Hit the subscribe button.